Could it? Uh, My video is starting. There it is. Watch. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm going to wait a few minutes here. To, oh, we have only one viewer on right now, so I'm just going to hang out here for a little bit. I might sing. I might have a cup of tea while I'm waiting. Oh, 11 viewers. Here we go. Everyone's showing it up now. There they come. All right, 13 viewers. Amanda asked if I'm going to sing. I didn't promise that, did I? I used to sing. I actually used to sing opera. I still remember some of it, actually. But I'm not going to sing it here. Because I was in a child's chorus in an opera, and an adult singing a child's chorus from an opera after his voice changed is really not a beautiful thing. I'm just going to wait another minute here to get a couple more people online. Okay. Hopefully we don't top out at six, 26 viewers, but uh, we'll get a few more going online. Hopefully 27. Okay, well, I'm going to start rolling here since we're two minutes in. Thank you all for joining us. This is just a chance for us to uh, answer a few questions and make sure that you know, you're getting updates from us about what's happening with the Divide 200. And thank you. We now have uh, over a thousand members in our Facebook group, which is pretty impressive. Uh, we've kept it pretty low key. We haven't really advertised this race or anything like that. And uh, so it's nice to see that there are some, uh, some new faces constantly showing up. Um, Okay, so I'm going to just start with uh, some of the submitted questions. And the first one comes from Mr. J. Will the distance between CP12 and the finish be 50 kilometers? Now, I'm not sure where this came from. I think somebody asked a group originally. It was maybe misunderstood. Uh, the distance between checkpoint 12 and I actually have it written down here. Checkpoint 12 and the finish is about 30 kilometers. It's a little bit less than 30. Uh, what we've been debating is what to do about a 13th aid station, if we even need one, uh, and where exactly that will be. Because uh, on, on either side of checkpoint 12 and between the finish, it's all park and protected area. And those trails are not, not open to ATVs. So just trying to work with the different uh, government bodies on either side of the Great Divide to figure out where we can put a checkpoint that's not going to interrupt uh, other users in the area, protect, possibly destroy some uh, sensitive habitat, which I mean, they're both trails, they're both designated trails, and they're former logging roads, actually. So I mean, they're in pretty good shape for an ATV. But however, on the BC side, at least, they've been really uh, against having any ATVs up there for many years now. That's not a new thing. Um, so we're asking for special permission. And once we talk to both parties in the Alberta and BC side, we'll determine where to put the last checkpoint. So basically, checkpoint 11 is the last place you get to see your support crew. And from checkpoint 11 to 12 is about 25 kilometers right now, unless we shift it, which we're considering uh, in order to make it more balanced on the last st stage of the uh, race. Then from checkpoint 12 to the finish is 30 kilometers. So from checkpoint 11 to the finish is about 55 kilometers. So that's, uh, you know, again, that's there's a checkpoint in the middle there. Uh, you can't see your support crew during that time, but you will have a chance to, to stock up and get water and get food and all that stuff as well. Also a question from Mr. J. I am looking forward to eating everything. What food options are available to us? So if you go to the website under uh, racer uh, information, I believe it is. Uh, I have it right here somewhere. If you go under racer info, there is a, an aid station list. 
and we've broken it down into two things uh, basic aid stations which have you know here are some of the essentials you're going to have and it varies a little bit based on you know where it is i mean it's hard to bring you know, if we're, if we're driving out to an aid station in the middle of nowhere on an ATV, it's really hard to bring in, you know, 100 liters of cola or something like that, uh, you know, because it's going to get bounced all over the place and uh, it's going to end up being a mess. So we don't tend to bring cola out if it's not a drivable road, uh, like a two-wheel drivable road, stuff like that. Um, and we're going to have the main aid stations, which are three, four, uh six and nine which are combined into one with the same location and then uh, 11 they will all have some more hot food and more fresh fruit and stuff like that as well and we'll do more fresh fruit in the remote ones as well if we can get to them easily enough again you know when we're packing things in by atv we have atv trailers that we use and all this but there's just a limit to what we can do um at the main aid stations we're also going to have supplies for sleeping that's the same uh, five aid stations. And we're gonna have blankets, cat mats, cots, a few cots, not like enough for everybody, but uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, if it back, gets backed up in the aid station, then of course we're gonna have to ask people to kick, take a couple of mats and camp on the ground. Uh, but I have a feeling that a lot of people will be just happy to lie down. So not personally too panicked about that. Although I'm not the one racing either, so <laughs> that's fine. Um, also on that page, you're going to see a, uh, please submit your food and supply ideas here. We really do want, um, we really do want to make sure that we're giving good uh, supplies to everybody. And, you know, that means uh, getting your feedback, what you want. You know, we have lots of ideas of what we can bring. Um, one of the things we do have to contend with here is that, uh, you know, our, uh, the Alberta Health and Safety has been really, adamant that we follow the rules at our events you know so that means it kind of not limits us but you know we have to really be careful we're basically being uh scrutinized in the way that a, a farmer's market or a restaurant would be scrutinized in, in some ways um you know they all have really strict regulations when they go to food festivals and whatnot and so we're going to be subjected to that as well Okay, so I'm seeing some questions pop up on the screen here. They're not coming in quite as fast as I thought they would, so I can probably read this one out here. Um, so for sure, Pacer from 11 would have to continue to the end 55K, depending on where their Pacer was picked up. We were actually just talking about this. Um, we were going to allow Pacers from checkpoint 12. However, that would give an unfair advantage to anybody who didn't have a support crew or a Pacer, uh, simply because the uh, pacer becomes kind of a support crew. So yes, the last pacer will be 55 kilometers. Um, we're gonna re review that a little bit more with the team. Um, we're using the Checkpoint 11 where it is because it has uh, built-in facilities. There are toilets there. It's an actually a little campsite. It's a little recreation area. So it makes it really easy for us to sit up there. And uh, if we move it anywhere else, now we're bringing in porta potties and whatnot, and it's it's really remote back there, so it's going to take a bit of uh, a bit of uh, stuff to get stuff, to get a bit of effort to get stuff back there. Uh, will the course be av available as GPX? Yes, it will be eventually. Um, the reason we haven't published the GPX right now is that we are still waiting on feedback from the government agencies. Uh, you know, we wanna make sure that it's all dialed in before we release it, because uh, what we don't wanna have happen is different variations of the course out there. Uh, you know, somebody downloads it and they don't realize something has changed perhaps down the road. And we already know we have to make one small change, uh, which we won't be announcing quite yet. Um, I can hint at it tonight, but we have been asked to make one change just because Again, we're working in a very uh, a very sensitive environment. the The landscape out here does require a lot of attention to make sure that we you know we're not uh, we're not doing any damage. Okay, I'm going to read some submitted questions again here. My two lovely assistants over to my left can feed me questions if they're coming up. Um, is there a central place or a couple of them that crew could leave a small trailer and come back to sleep and rest? So. There are 
three different kind of areas you have to think about. Um, south, where Castle Mountain Resort is, that's where our checkpoints, uh, let me see, one, two, uh, one and two are inaccessible by road. They are uh, ATV only or, or hiking in. So checkpoint three is in the provincial park. Checkpoint four is in a provincial park. And there is camping at checkpoint four. Uh, we actually are gonna book out the entire campground. And it's a big group campground. Uh, checkpoint five is at a campground, although the checkpoint is not in the campground. So you're welcome to go there and, and put a trailer in or a little uh, a van or something. Um, checkpoint six and nine, uh, at York Creek staging area. Um, now you're up into provincial public lands and that's a little different. Um, you can kind of camp anywhere you like on those uh, roads, pardon me, in those staging areas. However, there is a camping fee and it's an annual fee. You pay, I think it's 20 bucks for the year. Uh, living down here, I don't usually have the occasion to want camping on public lands in this particular area. So uh, yes, you can set up in different spots. We can, we're gonna be releasing a list of driving instructions uh, in the next month. And that's gonna, going to be for support crews and for the volunteers so they know how to get around easily. Um, so what that's gonna do is help us to, uh, help us to um, get you uh, familiar with the course in a better way. And you know, that'll uh, give you some ideas of where you can park yourselves as well. I, I, the second question from also from Miss S is, uh, are racers allowed to sleep in crew vehicles? So if you're at the designated checkpoints where you can meet your support crew, again, that's checkpoint three, checkpoint four, checkpoint six, nine, and checkpoint 11, uh, those five spots, you are allowed to hang out with your crew as much as you want, even if you go just a little ways out of the, the, uh, the checkpoint. Uh, what we don't want anyone doing is getting in a vehicle and leaving the area. Because what's going to end up happening is, you know, Joe will uh, decide to go back to their hotel at Castle Mountain and Sandra is going to go to their hotel in Pincher Creek and Tommy is going to go to his hotel up in Crosnes Pass and then Josephine's going to go down to her, her hotel in Fernie and all of a sudden we're going to have everybody spread out all over and it becomes a safety issue because we can't keep tabs on everybody. Um, so you do have to stay in the race area, but you can sleep in your crew vehicle for sure. Uh, we're not going to limit that by any means, as long as it's on site at the approved areas. Um, do you recommend carrying bear spray? I'm not looking for comfort. I'm looking for advice in this specific area. Um, this person's not from around here, so they don't really know about our bears, they say. And they're not going to be singing for four days straight to kind of keep the bears away. Uh, and as fun as it sounds, I understand. Um, it's not uncommon to come close to a black bear before either of us notice. Yes, that is true. And I will say that at every, I believe at every one of our races in the last 20 years, somebody has seen a bear or a cougar or a wolf or something like that. So with bear spray, I, I'm, I'm always cautious of saying, you know, whether or not to bring it, because I believe you should bring it if you know how to use it and you're comfortable using it. Um, what I'm, reluctant to do is tell somebody to come from away. Uh, they fly in, they buy bear spray here. They've never used it before. Uh, they're not familiar with it. You know, nine times out of 10, somebody who deploys bear spray is gonna end up hurting themselves. So you just have to be cautious about that. So I believe that um, we, uh, I believe that, you know, bear spray is a good tool. I also believe that things like noisemakers are a good tool. Uh, personally, I carry noisemakers. You know, I, I, I quite often carry bear spray as well, but I also carry something that's gonna make a loud noise and just hopefully scare them off that way. Um, I would say that the chance of seeing a bear is high, although my first reaction to seeing a bear wouldn't be to, to deploy, deploy bear spray either. Um, it, it, I mean, it happens in seconds and you have to kind of figure that out for yourself in the moment. But uh, my reaction usually is to see what the, uh, what the bear is going to do. And again, you just take a couple seconds to assess. And uh, if the bear is being aggressive, then yeah, you deploy whatever means you have. Uh, I believe that there are new regulations on bear spray as well. And I have to follow up on that. But I also believe that there are new regulations on bear bangers, which, uh, you know, they have been known to start fires. Are 
Are you guys gonna post questions for me? Like I can't see them on the screen very well. Are you guys gonna tell me what the questions are? Yeah, sure. Um, okay. What is the nature of the bushwhacking segment? Uh, well, this area is actually not going to be a bushwhacking segment anymore. Uh, we have to make a little course modification here, and we're not going to announce the specific new route right away. Again, I want to have everything dialed in before we start announcing changes. I'm not going to do them like one at a time if they come up. Uh, I will say that we have been asked to make one change in the public, uh, sorry, the parkland section. Uh, it hasn't been approved yet, although I talked to the officer on Friday. He's dealing with our permit, and there are so far uh, no big problems or concerns as far as uh, uh, the route we've chosen, except for the bushwhack over Barnaby Ridge. And they basically said that, um, you know, it's, uh, they basically said that it is uh, um, just not the kind of area where they want anyone bushwhacking. If it was on a designated trail, it would be no problem. And, you know, the reason I had put that in the race originally is because I've done that bushwhack and, you know, it's not uncommon to see uh, other people out there either bushwhacking like hunters or you know going through uh going through their uh um oh, sorry that's my train of thought see hunters going up looking for game on the ridge lines now the difference is that we're a lot of people and it's not just like an individual sport so we are going to have to remove that bushwhack and i will it's not making the race harder uh don't worry about that um although i'd love to do that to you it's not going to happen so you just have to stand by and wait until we get to that. Uh, okay, so some other questions popping up. Can Pacers mule for the racer? Does that mean like carry stuff? I mean, legitimately, once you're out there, there's a lot of sort of personal honor amongst everybody. Yeah, you know, I can't see saying no, because really when you're out there, we're not gonna know either way. So I don't intend to put in rules that are going to be only applicable if you're completely honest all the time because then it uh, it just sort of uh, deters everybody else. So, you know, um, if you're there with your pacer, yeah, I, you know, I, I guess they can help you with your gear. Um, the thing is you have to stay together. You know, that's, that's mandatory. You can't be apart. Um, you know, uh, if I were to say, hey, no, pacers can't carry gear, chances are somebody's gonna get out there in the middle of nowhere and they're gonna help their friend because that's what friends do. And by the time they get back to the next checkpoint, it's going to be, we won't even know because they would have transferred the gear back. So I'm not going to make that kind of rule. Um, really think about, about it though, it's a race for you. And the pacer is there to help keep you safe more than anything. Um, is there, are there max hours at a sleep station? Well, really the cutoff time is your, your big clue. Um, the official sleep stations are um, at the same five checkpoints that I mentioned. And they're going to have a tent. They're going to have a few cots. They're going to have a whole bunch of camp mats and blankets. And they're going to have a heater, uh, at least one heater. And you can stay there basically as long as you need. Um, and, you know, the only real limitation is the cutoff time. Now, you got to keep in mind, too, that they're going to be a lot. Like, we're not anticipating having all 100 of you at one location at one time. I just think that's statistically impossible. Uh, based on the you know the competitive nature of the event, we're going to be pretty spread out, even by the time you get to the first sleep station. So, which legs are specific pacer legs? So basically, anything after checkpoint six—that's the second half of the course. Now, just before the second half. Pardon me. <clears throat> so, if you are going to be uh, going north through Coleman, that's where you pick up your pacer at the checkpoint. Now, the places you can pick up your pacer are basically, um, it's gonna be checkpoint, uh, uh, checkpoint uh, six, nine, checkpoint uh, 11. And we may make some other locations available. We're just have to tweak the policy on that, but for sure, we'll be looking into that a bit more. What is the best way to volunteer at multiple aid stations without driving hundreds of kilometers? Um, the best thing to do would be look at the map and, and anything that is on the Alberta side is not that far apart. Um, you can also um, 
you know, just keep it into either the south or the north part of the course. Uh, we are going to be giving all the volunteers who are driving in a $25 gas card, and that's going to help you out a little bit with your expenses. We know that there's a lot of driving for people who are helping us out, so we want to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, we're helping them back in, in a similar way. Uh, how well will the course be marked? So basically, uh, we can't do like ribbons every 100 meters throughout a 200 mile course. That's just not possible. It's not reasonable. And also, again, I want to stress that we are in uh, an environmentally sensitive area. And that's part of our discussions with the, the, uh, the government is that, you know, we're working in the high alpine, which is very sensitive. We are working on in parkland, which is uh, has a certain mandate. So allowing us to do this race has been a big deal to start with. So. Um, it's going to be more sporadic. You're going to see it, uh, you know, some sections a little bit more. If it's really convoluted with trail, like lots of turnoffs and such, we're going to try to flag those areas a lot more. Um, more signs around just those locations. And some sections like the traverse over from Alberta into BC, when you go through North Kootenai Pass, we're going to flag a very distinct route through there because it is very brushy. Uh, there's an old logging road, an old trail up there, but it's really grown over. And especially at the dark, it'd be very easy to get turned around up there. So that'll be heavily flagged. And any area that is is basically convoluted, we're going to have lots of flagging. Um, again, you know, 200 miles is a lot to flag. We don't, we've been, we've been looking into all kinds of options, including some reusable flagging. Um, they haven't found a great solution with that. Um, and yeah. What's that? I think we already answered this one about the sleep station, uh, blankets, pads, some cots, and a heater and a tent. At, and a big communal tent at the sleep station is not like individual tents for everybody. Are we allowed multiple pacers? Now we hadn't really thought about that, and I, my inclination is to say no. So, uh, oh, at the same time, I should clarify multiple pacers at a time. The idea is that you know they're meant there to be there to help you. Uh, every time we add a pacer or another person out there, they become a huge liability. Plus, our planning with the government is, I don't have this up to show you, but uh, I have a chart showing basically, you know, how many people per hour are on the course in different areas of the, the race as you spread out. I'm showing these alpine areas where, you know, there is a higher sensitivity. We want to make sure that we're not having too many people in these areas all at once. And so by the time we get to some of the more sensitive areas, uh, later in the race, uh, we're going to be having, you know, less than 100 people per hour. Uh, sorry, less than about three to four or five people an hour in those areas. Sorry, to about 100 people total. Uh, that's the goal. And we want to make sure that we're not, you know, putting too many people on the trail. Besides, uh, this is the first race where we've actually allowed pacers. And it's obviously a different type of event from what we've hosted in the past. It's much uh, longer in duration. So we thought that it would be important to have a pacer to help people through if they need that. Um, some will, some won't. Um, I also recommend buddying up with people. Uh, you can be together as much as you want as racers. Um, you know, we, we encourage racers to help each other out. So, but if you're adding two pacers out there helping one person, that's not in the spirit of what we want to do. We're going to actually assign, you're going to, we're going to add this to your, uh, when you log into your account uh, for the race, we're actually going to add three lines for adding pacers. So you, we know that you might want to have three different pacers or something during the race. So we're going to let you enter the information for three people. And if you want to use a pacer, you have to let us know in advance. Uh, it's not going to be like to show up at the time and, oh yeah, I want a pacer now. Um, you know, we're going to have pacer bibs available. And we're going to make sure that the pacers are, all, are, are also going to have to uh, abide by all the same rules of the event. And that includes carrying mandatory gear. So uh, they're not paying anything, but you know they need to abide by all of the terms of the event and the spirit of the event. Can I still volunteer at a station that is full? Yes. Um, our, we, we shut it off because what we don't want to have happen is all of a sudden 20 people want to volunteer at one particular site, especially like a registration or something. Um, but what you should do if you want to volunteer and the station is full, put in your registration without a location selected and add it in the notes where you want to go or and who you want to work with. And we can always adjust that manually in the background. Like we can do that on our end as a uh, as administrators. 
Okay. And some more submitted questions. Should we have received an invoice for the rest of the entry fee? Not yet. I haven't sent them out. I wanted to have this Q&A first. Um, you know, some people had contacted us and said, you know, they were really unsure if this is the right race for them. So to be fair, I thought we would have this chat first and make sure that everyone understood, you know, their questions are answered. There is no lingering doubt. And I'll be sending out the invoices by next week. Um, and you'll still have some time, obviously, to, to settle that up. Um, we just want to make sure that everyone knows that, you know, once the, we want to make sure the race is full. And as we get closer to the event, it's going to be harder to replace people. So that's why so many races like this um, have strict uh, payment terms and whatnot, because it's hard to find uh, somebody to fill in for a 200 miler at the last minute. So, yeah, but the invoices should be going out this week or by next week. Um, are there spaces left? And are you going to do another draw or are we still on the wait list? So we, but the cutoff date, uh, I can't remember what it was now, the 5th of December-ish, I think. 1st of December? Pardon me. <clears throat> I can't remember uh, what date it was, but we drew all those names from all those names and we have a bucket here. And there was around 300 people that were originally in by the cutoff time. Anybody else who signed up after that, they're not really in the draw, but they'll remain on the waiting list. And we have it all dated when they submitted their entry. Uh, it has a date stamp on it. So we know uh, when everyone signed up and they haven't been, like we have these little paper slips here, like this one, uh, here's one that's already drawn. Well, I'll pick it up off my desk. So we have these little paper slips. Um, everyone who was in by the right date was thrown in that bucket and we uh we then start picking the, the names anybody else who wasn't in by the cutoff date they're basically on a waiting list right now so i believe we have well over 300 people now i haven't checked just recently um so if you were in the draw already you're still in the draw and we're still picking names i didn't we did actually have to, to pick a couple of replacements recently and i didn't make a big deal about it on uh, facebook live or anything like that because i wanted it just to get done because what, what's happening now is I, I'm, I'm texting these people saying, hey, you know, we had somebody drop out. We have an entry available. Uh, do you want to take it? I text them. They don't get back to me right away. Then they say no. So I don't want to make a big deal announcing it on Facebook now until, you know, we we actually uh, we're going to be at, we're close to 100 anyway. So I wanted to leave it at that. Um, it kind of feels like the big trombone bump, 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 when you draw somebody and they say no. So I thought I would just leave it as it is and just contact them personally for now. Um, what is the best place to stay in a hotel for myself and my crew and pacers? Uh, so there are, my Siri just turned on. Uh, there are a number of different options and you gotta kind of look at the course. Castle Mountain Resort is where it starts and finishes obviously. And it's not really central to the course, but at the same time, it's a great base. Uh, that's where my crew will largely be staying. Uh, for anybody who's working on the Alberta side, they're going to be basing out of there and out of Crow's Nest because we have a lot of resources in Crow's Nest. Um, so Crow's Nest Pass would be the sort of the second one. You're heading north. And uh, keep in mind that the drive from Castle to Crow's Nest is about 40, 45 minutes, something like that. So if you're looking to jaunt down from Crow's Nest to the finish, it's not super quick. Um, and then uh, Fernie side, I mean, realistically, you're going to pass through Fernie to get to checkpoint uh, 11, the last, if you have a support crew go around to that side. And it's a big, long drive around. You know, that's why we were going to have another station in there where uh, uh, support crew could meet you in the, in the middle of nowhere. But the chances of them getting from, say, the checkpoint 10 around to checkpoint 11, the racers will beat them there almost guaranteed because uh, uh although some of them will be going slow a lot of them would beat their would beat their support crew um so it's not that far across so we thought you know it's a little bit early to have another main aid station where you can meet your support crew uh so yeah i, I think uh, fernie you know later in the race might be helpful but i I still think that Castle and Crow's Nest are your, your two best bets. Um, there's also Beaver Mines. If you want an Airbnb, there are lots of little places in Beaver Mines, which is a little bit closer to Crow's Nest. Um, 
if you're comfortable driving the back roads, there are back routes in through uh, from Beaver Mines to checkpoint uh, six and nine. That might be helpful to you. Uh, personally, I always take the highway. It's just faster to drive on the pavement. Although the back road is a really nice uh, scenic route. And you get to go up this gnarly, windy cliffside road that uh, freaks a lot of people out. Um, okay, there's some more questions. These are all submitted questions. I'm going to get back down to some of the live questions now. How many in reaches do you have to rent? Right now we have zero because we haven't purchased them yet. Uh, we are buying around 50 for our staff and we're going to buy more based on what the uh, competitors want. So I'm estimating that we'll buy an extra 20 to rent out. Um, but we're going to send a poll out to racers to ask them if they need a device. Now, we recently announced our tracking system, and I should have gone over this earlier, but I think it's really important to talk about the tracking system. Uh, you look at the website and you go under live tracking. Again, it's under racer info or race info, racer info. And do, 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 do. lost my page here. If you go under race info live tracking, just below the course, it's going to talk about how we're tracking you during the race. Um, originally, we had said only Garmin inReach, and that is what we standardized on a long time ago. And we have a few of our own already, and we wanted that message, like a uh, device to device capability of, uh, it was really simple to talk between uh, inReaches. So we wanted to make sure that was all set up. However, this new online app that we found, it's uh, called Spotwalla, and it's really going to help to track people. And you can use not just Garmin, um, although we still encourage Garmin to be the device of choice. Uh, there are other devices. And if you go to the instructions of how to set up an account, it's, it'll tell you what devices are acceptable. Um, talking to the developer of Spotwalla, uh, they said that actually iPhone 14 with the built-in inReach is really great. And that's what he uses when he goes out. Now, Spotwalla, the advantage of this is it allows you to show everybody who's in your event on one map at the same time. So your spectators are going to be out there and able to see you from around the world. Um, and from an administrator standpoint, that's really helpful for search and rescue. Um, we're going to be tracking you the whole time. That's why we really need everyone carrying a tracker. So Spotwalla is, it's, there's no cost from us to use Spotwalla. Um, we have set it up so that you can use it. Uh, on, you know, based through our website uh, and through our Spotwalla account. Um, essentially, you're going to have to create an account in Spotwalla and it's cheap. Like I think it's seven cents a day US to have a Spotwalla account. Uh, so I believe it's, I think it's under $60 a year if you use it like year round without canceling it. Uh, so what you do then is you go into your account and you, I th think they start you off with like $2 free or something like that. So it probably would be enough for the event as well. Although I think this is a great thing to to use um, just with family and friends. I mean, you could have your personal uh, link through your inReach or other device that you can share with people, but this allows you to kind of start up and and, and have uh, like a page where it's like a more public page you can embed on your website. So if you want to have people following you all the time, it's really handy. I'm really impressed with how they've thought this through. Um, and so basically you're going to sign up for an account with Spotwalla it's super cheap to do. Uh, then you have to sign up for our location page, it's called. The location page is the Divide 200. It's public on the Spotwalla website. You can find it. Now, to join, you need a password, and we will send everybody the password later. What we don't want is to have just everybody and their dog out in public. I want to try this and sign up for it. Now, all of a sudden, we have racers in Denmark who are... Uh, you know, showing up on the location page and the window grows to the size of how many competitors there are. So if you have somebody in Denmark, it's going to shrink the map, like zoom way out to get everybody. Um, so we definitely don't want to do that. Um, it is a great little app and we really look forward to using it. We've been testing it ourselves and we're going to introduce this to all of our races. The Divide 200, it's mandatory to use this. Uh, just because this is how we're going to really make sure that we're keeping track of everybody. Um, when you are out there and your tracker is going, it only actually records you when you're moving. 
most trackers don't do much when you're not moving. It always reads like, oh, person's in, in motion, but send a new ping. If you're just sitting there, it's not going to update your ping every 10 minutes, right? So um, move more and you'll get more you know, get more pings on your map. Although you do have to balance that with your battery life as well, because you want to make sure that it's uh, that it's uh, not going to drain your battery by pinging too much. Uh, this also gives us the ability. We're going to ask you all at some point here, closer to the race, to send us your uh, location page, not your location page, your uh, your sharing link through your inReach. <clears throat> Pardon me, or other device that we can uh, message you personally then. Because what we want to be able to do is to uh, look you up through our files and have a link beside your name, uh, and then just be able to message you directly and you know get a hold of you that way. Um, all this is in the instructions that are there when you set up your Spot Wallet account and how to configure your, de your device to uh, to work for us. So back to the original question, we're going to have about twenty ish devices. If there's a high demand, we'll get more. Um, it's just money, right? Like we'll just. Uh, you know, buy forty thousand dollars worth of devices, no problem. Um, point is, we want to make sure that that you know we're providing what's necessary for safety, um, and this is really key to us. Another part of having a device like this, we want you to have something that, and it says this in the instructions, you need something that can show you the route that you're on, uh, and that doesn't have to be just. It can be a combination of your one device and your phone if that's what works for you. Uh, I use Gaia GPS all the time when I'm out exploring, and uh, it's been really great just to know where I am on the landscape. It's very simple, uh, doesn't work on cell towers, it's all GPS, so uh, I've been using that as well. And, you, you know, it's uh, it's one of those things where we just want to make sure we can track you guys. Uh, for your purposes, having that screen and seeing the course, that's going to help when you potentially go off course. Um, if we see you go off course, we're going to message you if we can. Um, but at the same time, I mean, you're the first person to be able to save yourself in those kind of situations. So it's a big, long, over, overly done answer to that story. Uh, with the Garmin inReach, we'll st you still need an active subscription in order to connect to SpotWalla. Yes, your Garmin has to be active. Your plan has to be active. Uh, the only way that your inReach or other device will communicate with Spot Wallet is if it has an active plan. If you turn on your inReach and your plan is not active, it'll actually say that you're not being tracked. Like it'll warn you that, you know, hey, you need to activate your subscription now. Um, you won't be able to do much. Uh, so a second question kind of along with that, is Spot Wallet mandatory or is it just the device? They're both mandatory. You have to have the device. That's what communicates with SpotWalla. Uh, and again, SpotWalla is easy to set up. Uh, we can even help you at the race if we have to. Uh, we want to make sure that it's all done. We're going to test it at check-in. We want to make sure your device is active. You know, we'll actually probably know ahead of time. But once you turn it on and you're like, hey, this is really cool. I want to play with this a little bit. It'll show you on our map in advance. Like you can, uh, we're going to open the sort of the re registration window for this, this uh, map a bit earlier so you can sign up. And then uh, you'll be able to see yourself on the map and you'll know if it's working or not because it'll give you a point of where you are. It won't be on our course, obviously. It'll be down in Montana or wherever you are when you when you sign in. But uh, that'll give you the comfort of knowing that you're you're actually active. And then we can go in and edit the start list or whatever we need to do. Uh, so it's really great. If we already pay for a Garmin tracking subscription, do you need to pay for SpotWalla? Again, SpotWalla is very cheap. It's uh, like seven cents a day. So I think for that uh, seven cents a day US, so for that 10 cents Canadian or whatever it is, uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely mandatory. You know, again, they start you off with like $2 free in your account with SpotWalla. So if you sign up for the race, you get active with it and you're running around with it and then you decide not to use it, you just don't, have to, you just don't top up your account. Uh, it's sort of pay as you go. So uh, super cheap. Um, you know, when I started using it, it didn't even charge me anything for the first while when I was playing around with it, uh, because I hadn't really done anything outside and, you know, it's, it's just really worth it to, to have it for this race. Um, we looked around a lot for solutions that would show everybody on one map. And, uh, this is going to make safety such, uh, it's going to make your safety 
uh, is it'd be much easier for us to to manage your safety out there uh, if something happens. So, yes, you do need a Garmin or other account to track yourself, and then you need to input that into your SpotWalla account. And then SpotWalla does cost a little bit. Um, and if you want like a seventy cent refund, I'll happily pay that for you when you get to the race. It's not going to cost you much. I think again, you shouldn't have to pay more than two dollars to use SpotWalla. You don't have to keep renewing it all the time. You don't have to keep your account active. You just top it up as you need it. So make sure that's all good and then you'll be good to go. Uh, some more questions here that were submitted earlier. Is there phone service at aid stations uh, to contact Pacers regarding the ETA? No, not really. Um, you'll get some cell service around Crow's Nest Pass. South of that, you're going to get almost nothing. In BC, you're going to get almost nothing. Uh, I'm going to paste a link here that is for the Telus and Bell, the two most the two companies that have the biggest uh, service area. Uh, let me see if I can do this here. I'm going to write a comment. This will show you their coverage map in this area. It's a TELUS coverage map, but it also accounts for Bell. They generally share towers. So you'll see if you zoom in, how, like they kind of, you'll, you'll be able to kind of estimate where you'll get service throughout the course. And this again is why having uh, some kind of uh, an in-reach um, device, type device so you can communicate with your people and having it on the uh, having it on uh, online too, especially in areas that are um, the uh, the uh, what was I going to say here? Having it, uh, sorry, I'm going to these things popping in front of me here. Um, having your support crew be able to see you uh, live, you know, again, this can be limited to cell area for them. But if they're coming into a main aid station where there is cell coverage, they'll be able to see you in advance. Uh, you can also message them through your, your inReach. Uh, I'm not sure I understand this question. Is SpotWalla like an alternative to track leaders, which some of you have been tracked by before? Yes, true. However, it's usually provided by the race. Well, SpotWalla is, again, like $2 probably for this race. And so I'm happy to... Uh, refund you the two dollars or give you a coffee afterward it's not a problem maybe i'm not understanding the question um it's we're not leaving it up to everybody to ensure their own safety we're going to make sure that everyone has these accounts um again you start with two dollars free when you sign up for spot walla and at least i did i'm assuming everyone else does too and then after that you can upload as much as you want as far as uh, uh fees to keep covering the cost of the spot walla account uh, if you just use it for the race only, I highly doubt you'd even use $2. Uh, again, it's about seven cents a day US. Um, so um, it is definitely something that we need everyone to sign up on. Uh, unless somebody has a, a better app that can show everybody on the same map at the same time, we're happy to look at anything. This is the one that we found works the best. Um, and there are others out there that people are promoting right now that you actually have to rent their own devices. Like it's not even free for some of them, but you would have to rent the device from them. And we want to make sure people can use their own devices. Um, and for our rentals, we're not going to make them like super high priced. I mean, that's not the goal. We have to pay for the uh, account. I mean, the account is legitimately going to be about $80 Canadian for the race for each device. They don't let you buy it by the day or anything. So it's going to have to be uh, for that whole month. And um, what we'll end up doing is just uh, you know, charging a modest fee to cover the cost of that and a little tiny bit to cover the cost of the device and upgrades and whatnot over time, like any rental company would do. Um, I really do encourage people, though, to have their own devices as much as they can. Uh, they're great to have if you're an outdoors person, if you're out in the in the woods a lot, definitely consider it. Uh, I never leave on a trip without it now. Um, you know, my crew, when they go out flagging, they take one now. Uh, when we go and do any kind of trail maintenance, we take one all the time. Everybody goes out with a, with a Garmin in reach now. Do, 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 do. 
when you delete your tracking points and messages from Spot Wallet, it stops charging your account. That's good to know. It sounds like David is already on Spot Wallet. Um, because I'm a, an administrator, I'm an organizer of events, they actually gave me a different kind of account. So I'm not 100% sure what everyone else is going to see, but I just know from talking to them that uh, it's, uh, it's a very basic software, very basic account, very low price. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. I suggest we have a designated time where we can test out the connection to Garmin and Spotwalla. Yes, I, uh, it happens on race day, no bueno. Yep, I absolutely agree. Um, you're going to be able to test it out in advance. Like I said, much like weeks before the race, we're going to send you all the password. You can probably even send it out in the next week or so. We'll send everybody a password. Um, the, uh, the, uh, yeah, the, uh, the Garmin is going to have to be tested and the spot is going to be tested together before you start for sure. Um, and I think I am out of submitted questions. And my team is feeding me questions here because I can't really follow the chatter that's going on on the side pane. So, um, what do you think? Do we have any more questions coming in? Okay, folks, we are at... 45 minutes and uh, we can stop at any time now. I want to make sure that, um, that, um, oh, the question is to slow down here. I'm going to read that. Whoa, they keep popping up in front of me now. It's hard for me to focus on the questions here when they keep flicking up the screen. Uh, a couple of questions about what will be at aid stations. Will there be heat fire to warm up? So at a main aid station, uh, definitely there'll be a sleep tent. We are planning to bring out heaters to at all aid stations uh, on after not not one and two because they're so early in the race. But everything past checkpoint three three and onward will have like a propane heater for sure. Will it be camping chairs? Yes. Will there be a type of bucket bathroom? Now our hope is actually to get porta potties to all of the uh, accessible road accessible aid stations. And so checkpoint three is at a public park. So there is a washroom. Checkpoint four is at a beautiful campground facility and it has washrooms. Checkpoint five is just down the road from a campground. Um, we're going to talk to them about how to best set that up. We might even move our checkpoint just a touch uh, if they will allow us to, to be closer to the, uh, the, the bathrooms there. Checkpoint six, nine, we're going to bring in bathrooms. We're going to bring in toilets. Checkpoint uh, seven, we're going to bring in a toilet. Checkpoint eight, we're, there are toilets there. Actually, they're not like right at a checkpoint, but they're just like 20 meters away. Sort of just a little skip across the field uh, to get there. It's kind of not really out of your way either. You kind of just have to deviate a little bit to go to it. Checkpoint 10, I believe there's still a toilet there, although I will say that that facility has been vandalized a lot. So I got to check in with the people that manage it to see what the current situation is. What I don't understand is why people will go out in the bush and, uh, you know, shoot their shotguns at um, public toilets. And uh, it's actually an emergency shelter. Checkpoint 10 is an emergency shelter where they have a um, uh, like kind of a, a warming hut for snowmobilers. And, you know, the windows keep getting shot out and people keep uh, trying to blow up the bathroom for some reason. I mean, I personally think it's a great facility to have in the middle of nowhere. So I don't understand why people would do that. But so I got to check in with them and see. Um, is there a rule for having to go in Canada? We were actually just talking about this. So uh, I think the, you know, if you have to go in the woods, um, I have never known anybody to bag up and pack out their waste. Some areas are more sensitive than others. Uh, in my humble opinion, I'm, I'll get some best practices together. I'll get my team to put down some notes here for us to follow up with uh, the parks and whatnot. But uh, my sort of go-to best practice is to go way off the trail, like 50 meters off the trail and go to the bathroom. If you have any toilet paper, then you would want to bag that. Um, but bagging your own waste is a little bit difficult. At the best of times and um you know bring it back in a pack 
is difficult. So I would say that uh, I'll get some more information on best practices, but I don't know of a particular rule that you have to not uh, that you have bury or whatever. But I haven't. I don't know anybody who's been burying their waste for a very long time. The it's always mentioned that you're supposed to pack it out, but again, that's more for solid waste, like a uh, garbage type waste, not for uh, poop type waste. Um, I think that's a safety hazard as well. So I don't know uh, specifically. I think it might vary per area. I know some areas like uh, in, somebody was just mentioning in Utah that you can't dig and you can't bury it. You got to pack it out. And, and th it's a little different here. I mean, we are surrounded by brush and, you know, it's the reality is that it's a uh, quite often it's dense brush, not up in the Alpine so much. Now, after having said all that, up in the Alpine maybe is a little bit of a different story. Um, Again, I will figure out follow up with some best practices of what to do there. Uh, do pacers need their own inReach and spot walla? No, they do not, because they're going to be with the pacer at all times. You never, ever, ever separate from your pacer. The only exception, I guess, would be if you're running to get help, uh, which is not really the intent, because you have a, a Garmin or a other device and that way you're going to be able to message people and let us know you know let message our hq uh, and let us know that you're in trouble and then uh, we'll come get you that's the hope so your pacer should hopefully stay with you all the time uh, our pacers allowed to be switched out only at the main checkpoints or can they be switched out at eight or ten now I mentioned this earlier, we're going to revisit this rule because it was pointed out to me today that uh, when a pacer shows up, we originally had intended to let them kind of meet you at any of those points. However, if a pacer shows up and they're bringing in like, oh, here's all the food and here's all the extra gear and everything, that is now outside assistance uh, above and beyond what we intended. It's about trying to keep it fair for everybody. Uh, some people will have pacers, some people will not. And some people will have support crews, some people will not. But um, you know, we just have to make sure we're clear on the intent. Uh, so we're going to get back to you about that one. But I, my inclination right now is to say only at the main aid stations. And I recognize it's a long way for a pacer to go. But there are a lot of people out there that really want to help you. Just know that. And they are decent runners and they're going to be there with you the whole way. So I'm going to scroll back up here and I don't think I've missed anything. Kirsty and Shep have been feeding me questions this whole time. So that's been a great help. Um, I don't think I missed anything from the submitted list. And so I do want to talk about bear, about bear bleh, about bears some more. We are going to change the gear list here at some point. We're going to add something that seems kind of silly, but um, we're going to do it anyway. It's just you have to wear something that's blaze colored. This is the fall and hunting is happening in some areas. It's not like there's hunters like shooting it up everywhere. It's not like that here. Um, high up in the Alpine, they are allowed to hunt uh, bighorn sheep with rifle. Down below in Alberta at that time, they're allowed to hunt deer and I believe elk with a bow. Now, the chances of a bow hunter like getting that close to you and not realizing you're a human, pretty low. Uh, but just to make it safe, you know, we want to make sure everyone's uh, wearing something bright, uh, whether it's a, a bandana or anything like that at all, something reflective preferably, and uh, you have to carry, keep it on you at all times. Um, this is something we talked about with uh, parks on Friday, and they're really, you know, just cautioning. And there was actually hunting allowed in this park too, which is not normal. It's one of the uh, intricacies of setting up this park, which only was created a few years ago. And so this uh, provincial park is, you know, one of these areas where hunting is allowed. And I have met hunters down there. And you know what? They're all really, uh, really good people that I've encountered in that area. Very responsible. Um, and on the BC side, hunting is open earlier. However, you're on a road and they're not allowed to hunt within 300 meters of the road. So that said, you know, everyone's just being safe. Just wear a piece of blaze and it... You know, there, there it's uh, highly, highly unlikely that anything is ever going to happen. But uh, we just want to make sure we're putting that extra precaution in place. Um, the parks people also asked me to talk a little bit about bears. This is their foraging season. And, you, you know, 
I'm kind of maybe of a different opinion than some people, but whenever I've met a bear in the fall, they are so focused on eating. They are so focused on getting grubs and berries and whatever else they can uh, before they're all gone uh, that, you know, they don't even look up at you for the most part. That said, they don't look up at you until they do, right? Because bears are unpredictable. So um, it is definitely a, a time when bears are getting ready to, to simmer down for the winter. So we're going to do a lot more bear talks going forward. Uh, we're going to send up more information about bear uh, best practices and whatnot. And the questions come up, you know, what kind of bears do you have in this area? <clears throat> Pardon me. And we have grizzly bears and we have black bears. And people sometimes ask, how do you tell the difference between a grizzly bear and a black bear? And the answer is very simple. You climb a tree. And if you climb the tree and a bear follows you up, it's a black bear. If the, if the bear knocks the tree down, it's a grizzly bear. That's the easiest way to tell. Um, and of course, I'm kidding. But uh, realistically, the biggest thing you want to do at all times is make distance from you and the animal. We have cougars here. We have uh, wolverines here, which is amazing to see them showing up in our region because they've been so rare. And some of my crew encountered a uh, wolverine last year during a setup for a race. And I was so jealous because uh, we don't see them around very much. And for me, having lived in the mountains uh, and you know, traveled in the mountains the majority of my life, to have some greenhorns show up and, you know, all of a sudden uh, be encountering a wolverine and having this wolverine kind of like was around the area where they were working for about an hour uh, and they got a great video of it. Uh, you know, just wow. I mean, I'm so jealous. Uh, we have wolves, if I didn't already mention that. Although wolves are very solitary here. They are not the kind of wolves that you're going to see, you know, tracking down some old ladies and children or anything like that. Um, you know, so it's a pretty, um, pretty, um, pretty basic stuff. Maybe the orange should be part of the swag. Yeah, that's absolutely possible. We can give you all uh, uh, some kind of uh, non-buff buff. Some kind of uh, head do thing, absolutely. We can definitely do that. Good idea. We'll try to add that to our list right now. Yeah, we're giving you some uh, some different stuff. Obviously, uh, if you haven't seen our swag options, you know we made an announcement the other day, and the swag for the Divide Two Hundred is going to be uh, obviously the shirt, but one of these uh, really uh, we haven't really figured out a name. Like it's a trucker hat, but it's got ear flaps, so it's like a, a trucker billy hat. I don't know. Um, that's what I kind of like to call it. Sort of hillbilly, sort of trucker, sort of in between. And we're going to give you one of our bivy sacks. We want you to carry that the whole time, just for emergencies. And because some of the areas you're going to in this race are really, really high up and remote, so. Um, you know, if somebody rolls an ankle and they got to hunker down for a bit, you really want to have, and they're only, I mean, uh, I don't, I had one on my desk a minute ago. I don't know where it went. Um, do, 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 my baby sack went away. That's okay. We don't need a baby sack right now. Don't worry about it. Um, the, uh, yeah, you know, and if we can need to give you some blaze orange, that's great. You know, we'll get you some blaze orange as well. It's gonna be a lot of fun stuff. Uh, let's see what else. Any other questions coming in? Red green hat. A red green hat. Yeah, kind of sort of. Can you tie this stuff to your pack? Yes, um, you can tie it to your pack uh, as long as it's visible. Uh, we are going to also give you multiple bibs in case you know you want to keep one on your jacket and you want to switch out some of your gear. We're going to give you uh, at least two bibs a piece, probably more. Uh, I haven't decided yet. Um, that way, you know, you can have it on your pack, you can have it on your chest, you can have it on your pants, you know, in your pants if you want, uh, whatever you want to do. And at least you have one that's always visible on the outside somewhere. Okay. It looks like we're winding down with questions here. And we're going to have some fun stuff. Yes, that's another question. <laughs> um, okay, well. I'm going to give one more minute for questions here. It's been just about an hour, which is great, which is what we kind of have planned. So hopefully that answers everything for everybody. Blaze Orange Bibs, yeah. You know, we're going to do something bright for sure. Um, I do think that reflective is a really good idea as well. Uh, unfortunately, we can't seem to get 
uh, reflective bibs. I'm going to ask our supplier again, but uh, you know it's going to be great. Uh, we'll have lots of great fun swag for you. And so I'm going to take one last skim through here. Any last minute questions? So hopefully this is helpful. I mean, uh, I know this is a new race for everybody. And we've hosted races for 20 years, and we have a pretty good handle on what's happening and how this is going to unfold. However, you know, we learn a lot when people ask questions. You know, we we can't anticipate everything. My old employer used to say that uh, a horse is always finding new ways to kill itself, right? They can always get, find a new way to get in trouble. So same with racers in a way, but hopefully not killing themselves. But um, the, uh, the idea is that, you know, there's always things that we don't, don't anticipate that are going to come up and you know you've all raced a lot so you are great to give us feedback um and again i want to just remind everybody if you go to the aid station list there is a uh, link uh there for filling out a little questionnaire about what kind of food you'd like to see keeping in mind that you know we're way out in the bush and we are working on solutions like we're actually going to get uh our one of our field managers shep He's going to start to rig up some, uh, testing out some uh, solarized trailers. So hopefully, you know, have them parked out at different aid stations so we can get a little more power out there uh, with some battery banks and whatnot. So retrofitting our existing trailers to, to add in some power possibly. So that kind of stuff. Um, we're also going to have a, uh, a battery swapping system. So we know that four days can be a long time if you're out there that long. We're going to have certain aid stations where we're going to have one of these little battery packs and you know you got to bring your own cord you have your own device but we're going to give you one of these at the start um it's not for you to keep but you know we'd like to get it back but we're going to swap them out during the race and that way you can come into one of the main aid stations we'll have a whole box full of fresh ones there you can just swap it out and carry it on that way you don't have to worry about it i mean if you don't really need it if it's only down like five percent don't swap it out you, know, you don't need to but uh that's uh, one thing we're going to do to help keep you guys powered up. If you're going to sleep at all, you know, hopefully we can also have, uh, again, we're working on power out there, different options, but uh, these are all pretty low, um, low uh, kind of draw devices as far as the power requirements. So yeah, hopefully uh, that works out well. Yeah. Shep brings the power. Oh, should we expect snow in the Alpine? <laughs> Ah, uh, yes, we live in the Rockies. And so that means if you don't like the weather, you wait five minutes and it's going to be different. Um, weather forecasts are no good until about a day out. And, you know, you can get a general sense of what's happening just by living here. You can kind of feel it. I'm one of those guys that can feel the change in weather coming in their back, you know, uh, get that little crick in my spine between the C4 and C5. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's hard to tell. Um, if there is a ton of snow, we're going to have to consider rerouting just because some of the Alpine areas may not be that great. Um, on an exciting note, um, before I forget, now we're going to go in overtime here. Um, I was having a conversation, like I said, on Friday with one of the parks people and a big project for the Great Divide Trail Association this year is to do some upgrades on the La Coulotte Trail, which is the first big climb you get in the race. And so uh, the executive director of the Great Divide Trail is one of the, uh, is a good friend of mine who lives here in town. And uh, we've been talking a lot about this race. I mean, the Great Divide Trail was actually one of the inspirations behind this race. And so we're going to be making a, a decent donation to them coming up right away here to, to help them in their efforts. Because when I heard they were upgrading the La Culotte Trail, you know, I intended to make a donation to the, to the group. Um, this makes a lot of sense now to, to contribute that before the race so they can actually use it for their, uh, their summer activities. Um, the intention is to make the trail a little more distinct, but also add in more permanent flagging so that it's easier to follow. Cause it's really, it's a ridge line. Like you're following way up in the Alpine on this ridge back and it's, uh, it's pretty gnarly. So uh not i wouldn't say it's like not dangerous particularly but uh it's definitely kind of threading the needle a little bit so they're going to make sure that it's uh definitely um uh, well marked and uh we'll have to do less flagging that way as well because it's already going to be really well designated and once you're up there really there's only one way to go so uh once you're on that track it's going to be pretty straightforward and those uh new markers they're putting out are going to be very helpful 
Okay, so snow was the last question. Um, you know, I would say, getting back to that, you, you can never predict the weather here. Um, the uh, the the snow tends to be really moderate in September here, if there is any snow. However, there have been years when there's been two feet of snow. Um, does uh, so la culotte, I'm assuming this means, does it need a chain like Yamiska? Or not that dangerous no you don't need a chain for this route it's actually a part of the great divide trail and they send through hikers there uh down that trail all summer long it's uh you know i know a lot of people who have hiked it and yeah you're up there for sure but it's not a particularly risky trail if it were a particularly risky trail chances are parks wouldn't have approved it uh i should say they have not approved it yet but in my discussion with them they didn't have any concerns about us using that trail um sort of off the record they they said you know uh they didn't have any particular concerns so um no no chains in that section um there are no spots that are that steep that you're going to be you know using a chain or a helmet uh, or any kind of a assistive apparatus for climbing or anything like that you know it's, it's all on your feet or on your hands if you like to i mean you can scrabble along like a like a wolverine yeah it's a great place um then the next traverse after that i, I mean it's right here um the second big traverse it's a bit of a loop that comes off the main road that's the whistler and table mountain traverse and the climb up whistler is strangely difficult um it's slow it's just long but then you get up there and i posted a little video on monday uh about our ski trip down there now we didn't go up <clears throat> pardon me <clears throat> we did not go up on whistler and table because because of the conditions it's very icy there right now um but it's uh it's an amazing traverse across there between these two it's a big long saddle and you get a, a view out to the prairies on the one side and you get a view into the rockies uh, on the other and looking towards the continental divide and then you come down off of that into the main aid station uh, 2.3. Uh, third big climb is going to be, well, there's a little bit of a kind of a misleading climb and it's it's a big wide trail, but it goes up through what's called Spoon Valley towards Racehorse Creek. And then uh, from there, you're gonna be heading down south on the uh, High Rock Trail, which is another highlight. Um, not it's, it's a single track, not particularly technical, but you gotta keep your head about you for sure. And the uh, the High Rock Trail is brand new. It was only, uh, it's been under construction for a few years now, but the Great Divide Trail Association opened it this summer. Uh, so that's great. And then the third big climb is another just sort of just deceiving one because you don't know it's really coming until you're right in front of it, but it's a big long climb up and over Middle Kootenai Pass. And that brings you over, or sorry, North Kootenai Pass into BC, and then down that road. It's pretty straightforward. You know, as much as I'd like to keep you going up and down the whole time, uh, this isn't going to be a 150-hour uh, race. And so the run down the Flathead Road is going to be a nice break um, and get you a chance to get your legs back uh, under you again before you hit the last climb, which is another big a uh, tough one, and that is up uh, through Middle Kootenai Pass back into Alberta. Uh, do we have any training groups or camps? Same as what Carrie does for the death race. No, that's something that I know that Shep and K and Kirsty are very interested in doing. If you haven't met them on my crew, um, they're both uh, um, active people in our organization. Shep's just returned from his hiatus down in the US working on his cabin and Kirsty is sitting right here beside me as well and uh you know uh we're going to talk about it we don't have anything planned right now for camps but uh definitely something we can talk about okay so with that i gotta get everybody to bed here so i think it's about time to, to call it and uh i want to thank you again so much <laughs> who is Shep? Okay, last question. That's Matthew Shepard, who's commenting above. He is our uh, manager of field operations, and he joined us last summer. So, um, by all means, though, in the meantime, if you want to go out on the course, uh, put, post that you're going, and you know, 
invite people to go with you. Uh, you're all seasoned runners. That's why, you know, you, you know, you uh, signed up for this. So, you know, take that initiative and uh, just meet other runners and get out there as best you can. I think it's a great to do that. So it's a great way, great way to build community as well. Okay, on that note, I'll say thank you one last time. And uh, we're going to post this video for everyone to see later on. And you can share it with your friends. And if you have any other questions, feel free to send them in. And we'll try to answer them the best we can in a hurry. Um, we have a massive planning document where we're recording all of these things when they come in. And, uh, you know, some of it, some of the even most simple questions can actually spur some pretty interesting debates about how, you know, policy should uh, be created around an event like this. Because, you know, it's all about fairness. Um, you know, one big thing I always say is uh, I have a crew member that wants to say, bring out, oh, hey, you know, uh, I think, you know, um, can I, I hand out some water to some people that I met on the side of the trail? That's now an unfair advantage. Like you, you've now helped somebody outside of an aid station that's not actually allowed. So um, if you're going to do it, you got to do it for everybody. So if that's the case, do you, do we need another aid station there? And that's the kind of planning we go through. Like if this spot is particularly difficult for people, uh, and you think we should have water there, then let's do it for everybody, not just for a couple of people that are lucky enough to run into you. So that's kind of how these questions evolve sometimes. They seem really simple, but we want to make sure that we are, uh, you know, being fair to everybody. And that's really the spirit of what we want to do. So, all right. Thank you again, everybody. And have yourselves a good evening. We'll talk to you again soon.